Yeah, today's episode is one of been looking forward to recording. Uh, for one of two reasons. Number one, I don't know if you guys can see my gold mic. I've been dying to make it work. Finally, it seems like it's working. Um, just tell me in the comments, has the sound changed? I've got this thing that makes me look like a DJ and I'm there like, Ayo, how did I not go to school for this? It's a sound mixer I think, or a sound card and it's got all sorts of sound effects and what not. You know those things that baby baby or yep, gotta get DJ. Um, I've got my lighting. So literally almost everything that I've been looking to get is in order. Just the quality of the camera, and that's because I still use my laptop camera. And the only reason I do that is because I work a lot on my laptop and I present, like I share screen a lot, that sort of thing. So it makes it easier to share screen that way. Otherwise, I would have uh, preferred to use a phone or something like that. But we're here. Let me know if the quality is improving. If it's not, I 100% am game for working on it. Um, today's video, the second and the main reason why I actually anticipated, um, I have been looking forward to making this video is because I'm going to be tackling three issues, um, if I can remember correctly where I wrote them down. But essentially, the first one is the village economy or, yeah, the village economy. I'm not necessarily going to tackle them in the same order, but it's something that I've always wanted to talk about. And I think um, I saw it fit that I do it. So I'm fiddling, um, just looking for things. I had my office cleaned and then now everything is lying around everywhere. So I can't find the notes where I put them, that sort of thing. Um, so just pretend I'm standing still. So it's the village economy, the whole idea of what to do with the land, um, uh, balance sheets for the village, I found my document, that sort of thing. And then the second one was Royal Papu Gang, and I'm actually gonna cover them, not in the order that I'm mention, mentioning them. Um, the second one is the Royal Papu Gang model. And so, but I will be covering that first. And the reason is I've always wanted to give people that have never seen this sort of thing, insights into some of the things that we're talking about when we talk about um, black economies and township economies and rural economies and unlocking those because a lot of the times it seems as if we're talking about pie in the sky or we're dreaming or we're still one day working to some utopian dream that may never materialize and so that's going to help in doing that and then the last thing that I want to talk about, um, these may all be three separate videos. I've started with the Royal Buffalo Game model one. The last one will be the big unanswered questions in finance. And that's just to give you an idea. There's seven of them that we look at when we look at financial planning, when we look at um, how to arrange your finances, that sort of thing. And then working, helping you talk through some of the things and work through some of them, just so that we can make uh, the, the field of finance accessible to you and work for you because it's no use you know all these words assets liabilities um, investments inflation dividends whatever but it's not working for you you're not using it because it doesn't mean anything in terms of how you see your life and the way that I've set it out is in backwards order for investment purposes but in forward order for how we normally do it. So it's the idea that once you're working, you need to consider how your credit use and your credit considerations. That's the biggest financial decision that you're probably going to have to make. From there, you're going to go into wedding expenses. And that's the wedding itself, as well as the honeymoon, that sort of thing. That's the next biggest expense. All of these that I'm naming are the big expenses, seven of them that have the potential to blow you out um, in life. Then you've got your mortgage decisions. So deciding what size house to buy, how to finance it, that sort of a thing. That's uh, another decision. College savings, quality lifestyle, retirement planning, and then estate planning. That's essentially um, the seven big decisions that you'll have to make in finance. As I said, 
However, for this episode, I'll be covering the Royal Bafu Gang model. And then the rest of the other episodes, I'll be covering the other topics. But I said I'm excited because I finally have it written down and uh, then, and I've got it uh, planned out. So Royal Bafu Gang, for those of you that don't know, maybe you might have been to Sun City. Um, I think that's about the best. Or you've got those colleagues go seeing that talk like with a high pitch voice and then they speak really fast, like it's one of people. Basically, um that's who I'm talking about. No offense, guys, disclaimers like I'm not tribophobic, you name it. Um I'm just trying to get you to relate. But essentially the Bafu Gang Nation. Um some of the facts you can correct me on. But the idea is to give you an example of a working village, a working kingdom, a working nation where in South Africa, people are actually living off, off of the resources of the land. So without wasting even more time, I'm going to jump into sharing my screen. Uh, I'm just going to move that down so that I start with the one that I want, which is that one, the Royal Bafu Gang Vision 2035. Now, for starters, I don't know how many of you are from a village and how many of you have seen this sort of thing. It certainly is the first time for me that I see any sort of vision from a village or from a population outside of the NDP and I think 99% of you guys have never read the NDP. You're not even sure what we're working towards as a country, but the NDP in essence is the vision for South Africa to say this is where we're going, um, hopefully by 2030. And if you find yourself stuck in the country, you ideally should pick that up. And depending on which industry you find yourself in or which community you find yourself in, you should be able to take the NDP and find what it says about the particular problem you're dealing with. And I think it will be one of the few times that I give away my political stances um, to say I'm more biased towards this type of um, a broadcast or this type of a, um, a video analysis because it deals with monarchs and royalty. I do believe in monarchs. I do believe in traditional societies. And the reason I do that is because when politicians have messed up everything, they essentially have got a home to go back to or they've got offshore accounts to go back to. Uh, chiefs and kings, traditionally, they are recognized where they rule. So if they mess up where they rule, they're just going to stay in a messed up ruling place. And I'm comfortable with that because they've at least got skin in the game. I obviously have got a lot of things that I would wish we could improve. Um, a lot of standing that I wish we could work on as a society to actually more legitimize them. I mean, I was talking to a friend who was um, organizing a mining in Daba and she got lawyers, she got finance people, she got entrepreneurs, someone from the Department of Mineral Resources. And I don't remember the fifth, I think an entrepreneur, if I haven't named that, and the panel of the panel was done. And I was like, why do you not have a tribal authority? And the reason why I say, why don't you have a tribal authority is because at the end of the day, the minerals belong to the people that live there. And obviously now we've got the Department of Minerals um, and Energy and whatever, Mineral Resources and Energy. So it's run effectively by the government, by the constitution, whatever. But those those are along the lines of essentially giving away, which I'm not a fan of. And I'm not going to go too much into that. Um, politicians have got their own platforms where they can shine. So looking at the Royal Bafu Gang Nation, as I said, look at where you're from and ask yourself, I'm, for example, from the Betty Nation. I'm also from the Zulu Nation. Don't ask me how. Does your monarch release their vision whatever, 2050, 2060, 2035, in this case, for the Bafugang nation. And interestingly, this used to be a vision 2020, where they aspire to be at a particular point in by 2020. And now being in 2023, it would be interesting to see if they've met that. 
And the reason I'm going through it, first of all, is to expose you to it, but also just to give you an idea of how well planned some people can be within uh, South Africa. As you can see, there's a forward, there's an introduction to the Royal Bafugeng, the long-term plan, plans of the Royal Bafugeng Nation. Um, we then have got the vision, mission, um, and plan. So we can look at that. Uh, da -da 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 -da. I hope your screen didn't move as well. Then we've got what is Plan 35. So they explain what is Plan 35. Planning, um, unpacking the targets of Plan 35. Then there's the special uh, master plan. In the special master plan, they're essentially speaking about what is the place that we occupy as the Royal Buffer Gang and how do we use it. Then there's how do all the parts fit together. Who will deliver the plan? How do we ensure funds into the future to enable Plan 35? That's where I'm probably going to spend most of my time. As you guys know, I predominantly talk finance. So all the other stuff, I know you can definitely read it yourselves. And then how are we governed? How are we governed for me is important because it's going to show you for the first time how a formal village works or how a formal uh, Black nation is governed with a monarch as well as in the context of South Africa and the South African um, government system. Yeah, well, um, then the last one is my role in our future. My role in our future, in essence, speaks to you as a citizen of the Royal African Nation. What is your role in this vision 2035? Yeah, well, and so, yeah, that's that. And why I like that part, yeah, my role in our future is because I don't know about you, but ever since I became an adult, nobody has ever come to me and said, listen, as a South African, this is what is expected of you. So I actually enjoyed that part of um, that document. As you can see, it gives you the Tswana terms, Kosi, Kosana, Mufugeng, Morafe. It's the hereditary king, the hereditary clan leaders, the resident who identify as having Bafugeng heritage. Uh, Morafe is a collective term for nation. All the members of our 72 wards, each ward is led by a Khosana. So now it's making sense that where you guys traditionally have councillors, they've got the Khosana. And essentially, they all ultimately come um, accountable to uh, the king. Right? And then, yeah, there's some other definitions there of important is these RBA, RBH, RBI, RBN, because we're gonna be spending a lot of time in those um, in those documents. Why I've been referring to it as a village is because they actually refer to it as a village. They say it's a formalized settlement within the Royal Bafugeng Nation boundaries, all right? Then they define, develop, enable, ensure, facilitate, monitor, that sort of thing. So that's just to go through the terms. And I'm just going to fly through the document. The important thing, and um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Khosi, but essentially, there he is, His Excellency. Uh, if I remember correctly, do they have his name here? Oh my God, that's the least I should have done in my preparation to reread his name. I used to know it so well. But he comes from a long lineage. I remember his father, I think, is the one that actually fathered this concept of a nation. And I think he brought it to life um, back, I think, in 2006 or 2005. And we'll touch on some of those things. And the foreword says, the long and rewarding journey to developing Plan 35 is a process still unfolding today. It began in 2014 when we announced that the new Bafu Gang vision would be complemented by a clear and hands-on plan of action to lead the Royal Bafugang Nation and its employees and family of entities, organizations, and companies to a new future. And there he basically lays out the foreword to the document. Right? Um, they say they kept the traditional council and the council of the Khosana constantly updated on the affording process, general RBA, Royal Bafugang administration task staff, also received Plan 35 newsletters, general staff, 
So this is actually how it came out. This organic process continues today. The booklet in your hands not only shares the Royal African Nation's present vision and plan, it invites you to bring your perspective to our journey and to help us by sharing your feedback for information on how to get involved. And that's where you go to page 54, introducing the Royal Bafu Gang. So who are they? The Royal Bafu Gang Nation is a traditionally governed community that has retained its unique cultural identity and developed world-class administrative and corporate institutions to enable the social development of its people. The location is 29 towns and villages in the Rustenburg Valley, uh, Bukonibupirima, Northwest province in South Africa. There's a population of about 130,000 people, and it's an area that covers about 12,000 or 1,200 uh, kilometers squared. And the language is predominantly spoken as Tswana in English. Um, the Bafukeng Nation uses long term and evidence based planning to deliver sustainable services to its people and to facilitate the emergence of an innovative and prosperous community, overcoming the legacy of apartheid and underdevelopment in our region. So they are very particular about what they're trying to do. And the things that stand out for me and why I wanted to cover it is because they're very long term focused, they're innovation focused, which we don't see enough of in a lot of cultural things, including in our culture as Mahoa South Africa, because I get it, we've decided to right now we're gonna adopt English, but we're not very innovative either. And you'll see the part where I get to be very critical of young professionals, those of that have worked, walked this um, entrepreneurial journey with me. You will remember that I am one person that believes that the future of this country is in the hands of young professionals. And the longer that they get stuck in Santon and the comforts that South Africa has to offer, the longer it will take for these sort of master plans to actually be rolled out countrywide. Because remember, for as long as you're giving your work to Discovery, Sunlam, FNB, whatever, your township doesn't have it. And look, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that you've earned the right to do. To do. Um, it's not a guilt trip or any other. I don't have scat for all of those stuff. But the innovative for me was important, especially in a cultural document, because it speaks to trying new things so that we can solve all problems. And then a prosperous community overcoming the legacy of apartheid and underdevelopment in our region. So they're very intentional about what it is that they're trying to overcome. And then they're situated on a large platinum reserve you'll see how they've developed um, out of that platinum gift that they got from God and then was safeguarded by their leaders. Royal Bafukeng Nation values um, transparency, accountability, and professionalism. All RBN institutions have had unqualified audits since 2006, and I can tell you I've known friends that audit the Royal Bafukeng Nation. Hint, hint, wink, wink, PWC. And then it says this booklet is a shortened guide to the plans and vision of the Bafugang nation. And actually there's his name, Khosili uh, Ruo um, Essentially Luruo meaning uh, wealth or inheritance, but yeah, more like a wealthy inheritance that he was given. That's the current monarch. Um, you'll see there the vision, uh, the mission, the plan 35, and then the special master plan. If you haven't been to the Marang Hotel, I think you don't yet know luxury. Essentially, the Marang Hotel, the Royal Marang Hotel, was built to actually house uh, the chief himself. And over time, they've then opened it up to the public. And I think it's the top floor, the penthouse, that, that is his room. I think that's the one that you can't rent out. And then all the other rooms, spacious, luxurious, beauty to stay in. As you can see there, it says, um, it is our tradition to innovate. As Bafugeng, we have long term, we have long been innovators, builders, and guardians of our traditions. In the words of Kosi Luruo, it is our tradition to um, innovate. Then it starts with the vision, the mission, the, Bafugeng, uh, the Bafugeng's vision 2035 is to be a relevant and innovative traditional African community in a changing world. 
There's a quote there that says we should orient ourselves to constantly renew our ideas, methods, and services. The three core concepts are relevant, innovative, and traditional. And this is the guide to everything that they do. I'm gonna skip the relevance and innovative because I think we hear enough of those buzzwords. But if you look to me to the left here, this is the, uh, if you've been to the Royal Bafugang Sports Complex, this is essentially where they try and host all of their sports activities and essentially have a multi um, sport facility. Um, what I wanted to jump to in the vision is traditional because often that doesn't get spoken of, um, except there are when we're arguing, or are you a traditional man, traditional woman, what does that even mean? And, oh, those arguments. Traditional in, in essence is our heritage shapes our core identity. We will never forget that our values and our land are what have helped and will continue to help us to withstand so many onslaughts. We will educate our future generation of the Khosana and our graduates will join the best institutions in the world. For Bafugeng, being traditional does not mean we cannot embrace change. Instead, it empowers us to do so. Guys, just imagine being born in this village, guys. Like, we are led. The mission, we the Bafugeng, Khosi, Supreme Council and Makhota, Together with those who share our vision and values, we'll create an enabling environment for the prosperity of current and future generations by developing the people, the economy, and the land. Our strategy for excellence is realized through zero tolerance for corruption and through courageous, innovative leadership rooted in Bafugang values. All right. Um, again, you can read most of the plan. What is plan 35? There we go. Plan 35 is the development roadmap that will guide all aspects of implementing our vision. Its structure originates in our national vision and mission, which we use to derive the three themes around which plan 35 is structured. Based on these three theme themes, we developed three areas of action that we need to address, each of which has its own goal, such as the logic such is the logic that guides how Plan 35 articulates our vision and mission, transforming them into a comprehensive and actionable framework to realize our aspirations. Areas of action. The first one is human individual development. This means working towards an adequate standard of living for our community. Off the cuff, what's the benefit for me being a Motswana, being a Mufugeng? human individual development work uh, they are working towards improve creating an adequate standard of living for their community the next one is development of the collective creating an enabling community environment and this one is very particular especially in the western hemisphere where a lot of our influences are in individualistic and what have you you know i remember one time coming back from work and driving past one of the flats and I was there thinking that, you know what, there's so many young bright minds that are locked in these buildings, cold, I think it was a cold winter's day or cold winter's night, drinking wine, stressed by work and possibly and probably not even caring about the work that they're doing, but they have no choice but to just do it because, hey, we said we wanna live this life um, of being our ancestors' wildest dreams, right? What I like about this community mindset that the Bafu Gang has is that it eliminates that component of loneliness and aloneness. It gives a more collective type of belonging because at the end of the day, human beings are social beings. I'm going to fly right through that because I'm, I'm, I'm primarily a finance podcast. And then sustainability and growth. And this is the emphasis or emphasizing durability and favorable economic conditions, right? And then it speaks about those areas and the themes. So under individual development, it speaks about healthy individuals, individuals with dignity. How big is that word in South Africa? Um, for people that were previously not considered people. Um, so individuals with dignity and then educated individuals. So putting the... Uh, graduations and whatever belts in your head. Often we focus on that last one, 
And sometimes that, sec that first one, but it's very seldom that we look at the individuals with dignity one as a core tenet um, of a document that we are um, uh, practicing. And you will see on the right, it actually speaks about how do we break those down? So the goal is longer, healthier lives. The goal is excellent public and municipal amenities. And then the last one is literate, equipped and employable people. Then we talk about community development. We're looking for a safe, healthy and appealing environment, a valued identity and cultural, cultural heritage, and then good governance and leadership. And then under sustainable growth, we've got stewardship of our resources and economic opportunity. That is where I will be spending most of the time. And as you can see under sustainable, sustainability and growth, it speaks to the protection and development of our financial and physical assets, as well as enhance opportunities for job creation and economic diversification around our land. Then unpacking those themes and those targets, it goes into a lot of detail in that regard. Um, basic services must be afforded to every household um, on Bafukeng land. I think if I remember correctly, I think something like education is free in the Royal Bafukeng, if I remember correctly, and they're building a university, something to that effect. Um, or if it's not free, I know that lower education is free and that sort of stuff. Uh, just for interest's sake, they've also got their own college, Livonia College. Um, where they say it's a beacon of what is possible, um, but the state state schooling system is where progress needs to be made. South Africa's national target for learners completing the secondary cycle by 2030 has been set at 80 percent. Given where we are today, this will require significant improvement, but we believe it's possible and have not only adopted the national target, but also have added a focus on raising metric pass rates to 90 percent by 2035 and they monitor the primary school completion rates, the ratio of learners per teacher, you name it. In other words, they're very hands-on about what they're trying to achieve. As I say, just imagine being a child born into this type of society where things are not just happening by luck or by incident, but there's a well-thought-through plan by adults, by people that are trying to get you somewhere. Um, I'm just pacing through because I'm trying to get to the part where it talks about how they finance all of this, which is where we come in, the money people. What is the spatial master plan? For those of you that don't know, this is essentially how um, the area looks um, in the Bafugang nation. So we've essentially got the whole Northwest and inside the Northwest, You've then got uh, the Bujanala Platinum District, and then you've got the Bafugeng that are inside of that um, district. And then when we enlarge it even further, it looks essentially like that. And then how do all the parts fit together? They then explain a vital plan of plan. The vital part of Plan 35 is the special master plan in the or the special master plan is a land use plan broken into phases from the present to beyond. It proposes approach, appropriate zoning for all Royal Bafugang Nation land, as well as for the rest of the Rustenburg local municipality. As such, it integrates Bafugang into the greater Rustenburg and aligns our spatial development with that of the municipality and province. So that's where you start to see where Horsi will then let go and let the municipality take over. But you can best believe that these are not people sitting down. The standard of life within that nation, oh my God. You know? And then if you have there, it also adds some of the common questions that people ask, as well as the vision, and you name it. Who will deliver the plan? I particularly liked this one because it actually put individuals, it put number of targets and who are the implementing agencies in this regard, in, the, in that regard. And you will see that right throughout, it's got all three sectors. So you've got Royal Bafugang Investments, then you've got Royal Bafugang um, S, I forgot what S is, I think it's services. 
and then Royal Bafugem Holdings. And each of them have got a target that they're talking towards. And then how do we show, how do we ensure funds into the future to enable Plan 35? Yeah. Cool. That's where the video begins. Finance. Hi guys, welcome to my YouTube channel, blah, blah, blah. Page 28, right, of 33. To achieve our vision, mission, and plan, we will partner with government, corporates, and non-profit organizations, but we also need to have our own resources. As the Bafu game, we are fortunate to have an intergenerational investment fund controlled by a company called Royal Bafu Game Holdings, and I will show you that company now. Our investment strategy is simple. First, our fund must be maintained so that it, cont it can continue to generate income for our community after the depletion of platinum in our land. And already I can touch on some of that. The Royal Bafukeng has gone, um, Royal Bafukeng Holdings has gone from being 90% mining focused in 2005 with a portfolio of 22.4 billion to essentially now being less than 30% in mining and everything else carrying the rest of the portfolio and being valued at 46 billion rands. So over 16 years, that is roughly what 22.4 times two is what 44.8 and then remaining about another 2 billion in there. So you're looking at roughly 110% growth rate over the 16 years, which is something like, I'll tell you now, 110 divided by 16 years, a 6.8687% uh, growth rate, which is actually very humble. Um, and it actually speaks to why I always advise against uh, looking out for returns that are astronomically so high that you don't even know how the people achieve them. But the important thing is to see how realistic they were and how important it was for them that they make sure that they clearly define what it means to actually safeguard assets. The second one is this quotation that you see here where it says our annual expenditure is 2% of the fund's total value each year. So that's a very important number that I will take. Whatever you see them spending, just know that they are backed by 98% worth of assets. And that's really the crux of financial uh, planning. You want to be in a position where you're living off your assets, not necessarily living off just your job, right? And what you should be doing with your job is buying assets so that you can then live off them. So, yeah. What we have with the Royal Buffalo Gang is that they essentially are living off 2% of the total funds value. And already we can calculate that if they're dealing with a 46 billion rand fund, 46, 2% of that is, how many zeros does a billion have, guys? So we're looking at 920 million. So if they have a, so they have a budget of about a billion a year or 920 million, because 80 million, you can't just round it away. Like who's ever gonna give you 80 million rands? That's basically the annual budget, the billion rand for 130,000 people. Just out of curiosity, if I divide that by 130,000. So roughly 7,000 per person. That's That's quite modest. That's quite modest. It then gives you a newfound respect then for what it is that they're able to achieve, you know, on 7,000 rand per person per year. Hello, happy kids. I'm gonna come back to the slide um, about um, how they're funded. I just want to touch on how they governed. And the reason I want to touch on it is because so often we demonize the Khosi and traditional leadership so I do want to just cover it. As you can see, so you would read this diagram from the bottom up. So it speaks to the individual Mufugeng here at the bottom. As the individual Mufugeng, you are expected to do three things in your village or in this village. 
Number one, you're expected to be part of a kotla or a kutle, right? A kutle is essentially a little uh, group of you guys, maybe 10 homes or whatever, but it's like your mini village, your mini group of uh, people in this village. Then you also are supposed to participate in voting in the administrative regions, i.e. the 29 villages are divided into five administrative regions. And then you also are supposed to participate in the Kota Hote. This is the gathering of the entire community. So imagine that every year President him calls a, an assembly and then we all go and then we discuss the, na the nation's agenda. In this Kutle, you, the 72, uh, the Kutles will then go and form 72 Kotlas, right? And those quotas essentially are what are led by the Khosana princes, essentially. That council, the Khosana, is then where they will meet and they will report to the Supreme Council. This is the joint sitting of the Council of the Khosana and the traditional council. Again, if you go the route of the administrative region, the traditional council is elected and appointed. Councillors represent our five regions. So this is where the politics come in. And then at the Supreme Council, that is where they would then consolidate all of their views. And then all of them will then report to the Khorsi, the traditional leader. So you get to see and get to have a full appreciation of the role of the Khorsi, as well as the role of government in this particular instance. And then where it's the gathering of the entire community, and that is where the Khorsi will then address. And you can even say it's akin to the state of the nation address, but for a village. And this just shows how you can merge the two, but without letting go of the other. Because as you can see in this document, it's very much um, traditionally run. I think they said it's one of their core values. And then the rest of the document speaks about your role um, um, in the quota and how you can participate, and then the rest are for notes. So I'm going to go to, I'm going to hopefully fly through, because even though it's the crux of my uh, presentation, I'm going to fly to the Royal Bafugeng Holdings um, page. So the Royal Bafugeng Holdings uh, Company, this is where all the investments are held. So those investments that we said they only spend 2% off, you're going to find them in here. So they've got everything. They're about the Royal Bafugan Holdings, about the Royal Bafugan Nation, the business highlights. Let's go to business highlights quickly, right? As you can see, some of the highlights of the 2020 year, 2021 year has been the acquisition of a 6.62% stake in Discam, 8.7% stake in Notem, um, receipt of maiden dividend from Royal uh, Bafugan Platinum, a partial sale to Notem. They eventually sold it as well to Impala. The shareholder, 3.38% um, in transaction capital. Rand Merchant Investments, if I remember correctly, I think they're 13% shareholder. So for those of you guys that think it's just Anton Rupert, or who's the other guy? Yeah, it's Anton Rupert, is it? That owns Rand Merchant Bank. Newsflash, the Bafugang Nation is a 13% shareholder in there. They're also a partial shareholder in First Rand and then also in Growth Point. So a lot of, um, as you can see here, purpose-built student accommodation, as well as the property, a lot of properties um, that are involved in and around Gauteng and the surrounding country. If you look at the financial performance, look at that. They've had a 46, so they're holding 46 billion rands worth of assets, and then they get a dividend of 747 million. Remember that budget of mine where I said they're dealing with about a billion? We get to see that that billion is actually 74, 774 million. They've reduced their debt by 33%. Those of you that know me know very well that um, I'm a huge fan of debt-free uh, vehicles. And then it basically explains the unlocking shareholder value, that sort of thing, right? And again, what pleases me about um, this presentation and what pleases me about all of this is that you are dealing with a cultural village and you will see in the video that I'm gonna make about how to build the village economy, 
you're gonna see, and I think I'm gonna put it up here. Yeah, it's gonna be up here, not down here, up here. I'm going to talk um, to how you can do this even without platinum in your village. This was just a brilliant example. So essentially they hold all of these assets and then these assets pay dividends and then they use these dividends to invest in infrastructure. And I'm about to show you now. So this is the who we are, the executive team, the investment team, what have you, what do they do? The business philosophy, the investment portfolio. So that's where I'm gonna go into the investment portfolio. And in essence, what the returns from this investment fund does that Royal Buffalo Gang has. So you have Royal Buffalo Gang, then you have a trust underneath it, that is the investment fund. And what it does is that it pays 2% to fund the following developmental expenditure. And the view is that by 2035, we have done this so well that we have moved away from mining. As I said, there used to be a 90% mining based community. Now they're down to about 30% and possibly even lower than that, right? And as you can see now in front of you, these are the investments that they hold. But before we jump into the investments, what they spend the money on, they spend it on infrastructure. So a lot of the times if roads, that sort of thing need to be upgraded in the Bafokeng nation, they're going to spend on that despite their partnership with the municipality. On education, as I said, as far as I can remember until somebody corrects me, perhaps in the comments, education is free in the Royal Bafokeng Nation. They've got a primary school, they've got a high school, and they've got a college, Leibonin uh, College. Health, equally so, hospitals, then security, sports as well. Those of you that remember um, Platinum Stars, that used to be from the Bafokeng Nation. I don't remember if they've sold it or they've since changed the name, what have you. We'll come to that. And then the governance system. We've already covered the governance system. Under governance system, essentially, that is how they pay their chief um, or their king under from the, that um, investment fund. And as I said, the 2% implies that they're essentially going to be able to draw from this for the next 50 years. Now, if you look at their diversification or their portfolio, First of all, in mining, they are a 8.67 shareholder, percent shareholder in Northern Platinum, which is, I think, a 45% shareholder in Royal Buffalo Gang. Let me actually have a look at that. So what they've done is they've moved away from investing in their own uh, mining, but also then investing in diversified mining. Uh, if I can just go to the fact sheet here, you'll see there they're an 8.67% shareholder in um, this company. PIC is a 17.5% uh, Fed 3 old mutual. Your guys' faves are there. And then you will see as well that some of the companies that they are a shareholder in, I think if I go to Royal Bafugeng itself, um, Royal Bafugeng Platinum, you will see that no time is a shareholder in that. Okay, my battery is low, I'll charge it. If you check a 34.52% shareholder in Royal Buffalo Gang. So they still hold a significant, they still get a significant return from the Royal Buffalo Gang mines itself, right? Now, if we come back to the list of investments, this is where I was thoroughly fascinated. So in RMB and RMI holdings, the 13% shareholder, then the a shareholder and the Royal Investment Manager, I was thoroughly impressed that the transaction capital shareholder, they own 5% and then 3% of first rent. Already you can see just from those significant shareholdings how well they're moving away from mining. They're also a shareholder in Yebo Year 2. I think that's both uh, MTN's one, if I remember correctly. Uh, let's just click and follow the link. Yebo Year 2. Yeah. 
now that it's red, I suspect it's Vodacom. I says, yes, Vodacom, yes. So the shareholder in that, a significant one, I must say. Then liquid intelligent technologies. Then when you go to infrastructure, look at some of these distributed power in Africa, Stanlib Infrastructure Fund, Adam Solar PV, Electra Capital, Goda Wind Energy, Sishin Solar Energy, Holco Water, Dipalo Palo. What's interesting to look at that list of infrastructure, as well as mining 